We're at, uh, in Amsterdam here at the IS meeting. We really appreciate Meg Doherty, who is with World Health Organization, uh, Director of Global Health and uh, Policy in HIV and Hepatitis C. And we, uh, there's so much to talk about at this conference, we decided what you'd cover, I think, global issues right now. That would be the first thing, because you're the person that can answer those questions and address those issues probably most prominently. Okay, well, thank you. And I'm just coordinator, not director right, yet, right, so okay. that's good. Well, I'm but glad I, you clarified <laughs> that. <laughs> but in any case, in the, I think what's really important now um, coming to this conference, which has been a really exciting conference, is about where we are with our global numbers. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? Is it a better situation or a worse situation? Mm -hmm. What we know is we have approximately 37 million people living with HIV mm -hmm. in the world globally and that we're close to 60% of them having access to and being on antiretroviral therapy in this past year. But the less good news, I guess we could say there, is that we've had um, what looks like a slowing down of the um, number of people who are dying from H uh, who are who are being saved from dying from HIV, and a slowing down in the number of uh, new infections averted. So this past year, our new infections are somewhere around 1.8 million, which is about the same that we had in the previous years, and our deaths are around 1 million. And so in many ways, uh, we need to work much harder to ensure that we get more people onto therapy and that they stay on lifelong therapy and that their viral load is suppressed over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's also some other interesting things in terms of global health and global HIV treatment and care that have been happening at this uh, conference that are really relevant to um, probably your, um, uh, uh, your constituency. One is about what is the role of the new drug integrase inhibitor dolutegravir for low and middle income countries. And there has been quite a bit of interest around dolutegravir, as I'm sure you know, because it's a drug that has high potency, it reduces the viral load quickly, it has an increased barrier to resistance, and over this past year we've seen a new combination pill of tenofovir lamivudine and dolutegravir become available um, for a very low price point in low and middle income countries. So that now in some places in the world, it's between 70 and $75 per person per year for that treatment. And WHO was also uh, preparing for a guideline process that happened in May. And early in May, we um, heard about and learned about, as many people did at this conference, about the Sapamo study from Botswana that showed among women who were taking dolutegravir before pregnancy that there is a potential risk of developing, that their infants would develop a neural tube defect or mm -hmm. a severe birth defect that um, almost uh, unanimity, almost uh, uh, all the time causes death mm -hmm. uh, for that infant. So we've looked at that data and WHO at this conference put out guidelines around the use of dolutegravir. And what our, um, our guidelines show is that overwhelmingly, we really see there's a big benefit to being able to use dolutegravir mm -hmm. um, for populations, for adults, for children up to the age of um, uh, over six years old and for um, adolescents. But we also put out a note of concern around women who are of childbearing potential, that we'd like to have them have options to be able to use dolutegravir at the same time as having options to use contraceptions. So what WHO will do from, from now until about a year from now, um, we'll be following to see if there are any more cases of this birth defect. Understanding what the, real, the risk is. Is this a real association or is this or just not. an early yeah. signal? Mm -hmm. And to see if we can come up with more definitive guidelines about how to handle this um, unfortunate finding that, mm -hmm. that has come across. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking to, to really being able to work with countries and communities right now to be able to help them bring in this great drug for the majority of the population and then work to bring in sexual and reproductive health and mm -hmm. contraception options mm -hmm. to women who really would like to access this drug as well. Right, because allowing people to make their own decisions is really critical. And, if, and also the issue of around 
uh, if we learn that there is a problem with the Dahlia Tiger Revere, uh, it's great that we are watchful of that yeah. at this point. So it's, it's important for our audience to know that and yes. not to be alarmed, just to be watchful. And that way we can uh, do the right thing. So are there any other, I, I mean, the thing that I guess I always ask is, because it seems pro, predominant at all the conferences, how to spend the money more smartly. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned $72 or $75 a, a year mm -hmm. for a drug uh, is very good for low to middle income countries. Uh, because in many cases, these people have to pay for it themselves. I, I know that isn't maybe all the time, but, but I've been down that road with people yeah sitting in your chair saying, I don't know how I can do this. So this is good news because it's something that's probably more affordable than what they've been using in the past. Yes, absolutely. And I think the challenge we have is this combination pill um, uh, is available in countries that have low and middle incomes, but in the middle, higher middle income countries uh, in Latin America and Asia and so other, other places in the world, it's not as uh, accessible at that price. Mm -hmm. And so for, for many, re, play, for many concer, uh, reasons, we're concerned about that because mm -hmm. some of the areas that have the increasing incidence are the places where they have to pay a lot more for their drugs. And, and the people that are poor are still poor. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's ironic that, that somebody in another country uh, is just disqualified because their country is such while they are poor and they still have to pay for the drug. Yeah. So it, I think it really should be more about on a, per, a patient basis rather than on a country per se. Uh, well, I think also we have to look back at the public health approach because WHO um, promoted what we call a public health approach where we're doing the best for the most people possible mm -hmm. using the resources in the it's most the efficient picture. way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we've been able to scale up to get nearly 60% ARV coverage in the world um, because of a public health approach. And what mm -hmm. that means sometimes is that not every single choice for every single person will be available in mm -hmm. every place. Why? Because you gain efficiencies by having a single package drug and, and having supply right, right, change right, right. that can bring the same. And you have efficiencies of having one or two simple messages that um, auxiliary healthcare personnel can use to start people mm -hmm. on antiretroviral therapy and follow up. Once we get into that patient doctor individual conversation, then the supply chains and then the complexity around messaging is, is mm -hmm. increased. But, you know, I think we're going to have to see that um, as we move forward, people centered care is important to mm -hmm. WHO. So the public health approach doesn't mean that you can't have people-centered care. Mm -hmm. So that people-centered care should be about doing the right thing for the person at that time, having an understanding, mm -hmm. but within the context of what are the most efficient, available, and best drugs that you can bring in, as opposed mm -hmm. to having 20 different choices of drugs. Or, or maybe have a waiver and exclusion or something. Right. I mean, I mean I, I'm, all I'm saying is I don't know the answer. Yeah. And, but I, I hope that you would be, uh, you're smart enough to say, we would have a problem here, we have to try to fix it, try to find ways for people to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get to the drugs. Like Dazon said, we're not the, the cure is not here until everyone is, uh, not the cure, but the, the end of the disease is not an end until it's an end for all people. And there are a lot of people that aren't even started on treatment. Absolutely. And that's, that's really, uh, as we know, U equals U, so that makes sense from a, a general population base and from a uh, standpoint of governments, uh, get the people treated and yeah. it's gonna save your company or your country lots of money. Down the line. No, we, we absolutely agree. I mean, I think if you start to look at the 90 90 90 targets in Cascade, it's different in every region, it's different in every country, and it's different in every age group, in every population. Mm -hmm. And part of the meeting here has been about building bridges. Mm -hmm. And I think it's building bridges to those populations that have been left behind, primarily to key populations. Mm -hmm. And we can see that in certain parts of the world, it's within key populations that there's an ongoing increased incidence mm -hmm. in HIV. And it's also within populations that may not yet understand or have had information, young people, about what their risks are. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're seeing new infections. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about testing, offering 
opportunities like self-testing in this group. It's about these groups. It's about bringing them into the healthcare setting so that they can access the treatment. And then it's about having enough viral load available so that uh, people can know their viral load and understand um, uh, what that means right. for them and for they the should, population. We, we should have a basic criteria by which each person who's living with AIDS should have a certain understanding of the yeah. disease, which they own. So, yeah. And I, I think it's really critical that we have the, the ability to, um, to understand that every, even within a country, you have, can have dramatic differences in access because of the geographics of the country or the uh, economies or, or whatever it might be. We taught a lot of people sitting in your chair that said, hey, uh, we're going to the mountainous areas and we just can't get to the people. Sometimes you have to walk an hour mm -hmm. from a place where the road stopped. You know, so this is pretty uh, amazing uh, fortitude to do the work and have that kind of an experience to, to get to the people and Absolutely. or get the people to the, the treatment. Absolutely, and that, that's another element of it that I think has been highlighted at this conference is sort of how are we doing with these sort of differentiated models of care that mm -hmm. we rely on community health care workers or peer workers who are doing this kind of work exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it really is um, a testament to how important communities feel about keeping the, them healthy, but also the commitment to, to others in the community about sharing that burden mm -hmm. of picking up pills, bringing them out, et cetera. Yeah, no, yeah. it's pretty amazing. This, uh, this uh, world has to get a lot more uh, concerned and, and empathetic with the populations, and I think seeing more of the people. When we're here, we see the people in with the aid, with AIDS, and certainly the case managers and caregivers and so forth. But a lot of times, the the big people don't get to, the governments don't get to see the people, and I think that's what's uh, really missing it, it on a daily basis. More people need. That's why we do our show because yeah. we have a lot of people live with AIDS, many of whom who are researchers as well and they get to tell their stories and it's uh, it's sometimes pretty sad. Yeah, no, I think um, you're absolutely right and we've spent a lot of time, or I've spent a lot of time, not in the plenaries this time, but mm -hmm. meeting with community groups, meeting mm -hmm. with women living with HIV because mm -hmm. I think this issue around choice of ARV is so important mm -hmm. and um, this issue around understanding what is a neural tube defect, what is this risk, is it real, mm -hmm. what do we know about it. It was so important that we could have those conversations. Yeah, and, in, in the proper perspective. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, we've been happy to be at this conference and I think there's you know, there's a long way, of, there's a lot of work to do and a long way to go to full epidemic control. But yes. I do believe yeah. that we're making headway and yeah. that we're getting closer. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we, we hope so and we keep on hoping that it will find a cure. But in the meantime, we have to work hard. Yeah. Thank you I so agree. much. I really appreciate it. I